Welcome, Welcome. Davin and Dan. I'll leave it to you guys. That's awesome. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, officially, everyone. Hey there, Dan. Good morning, Davin. Or good afternoon, Davin, or good noon, Davin, whatever we're supposed to say. Right on the clock, aren't we? Yeah. All right. Well, perfect. Well, let's let's get started. I'm going to share my screen, and uh, we'll go ahead. All right, so uh, Dan and I are going to be uh, tag teaming this presentation, and I, it's, it's about the Ontario uh, Muskie Angler Log Program that uh, Muskies Canada does in partnership with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and um, talk a little bit about the, uh, the perspectives here that we're going to cover in this presentation, the first being that of uh, Muskies Canada, uh, what the program is, its successes, challenges, and some of the enhancements that we've made to that program in the last five years or so. And also, uh, Dan will cover the second part where he talks about the provincial perspective on how this data is used to um, uh, manage the uh, muscle fishery within the province of Ontario. So from the Muskies Canada perspective, the log program goals and objectives, we have to go back to 1978 to the inception of the club. And it's been a core initiative of Muskies Canada since that time to do volunteer angler logs. And we've done that with in partnership with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, and one of the, the key outcomes of that is contributing towards the management, conservation, and protection of the muskie fishery within the province of Ontario. And, and I'm gonna, this presentation focuses on Ontario, but I also want to mention that uh, we're very active as well in Quebec and New Brunswick. So the data that's collected, it's, it's a valuable management tool for the decision making and monitoring the health and sustainability of the muskie fishery. Dan's going to go into some further detail as, as to how the ministry uses that information. But as I said, the, the program itself, it, it goes across provincial boundaries. As Muskies Canada, we have chapters in Quebec and also New Brunswick. And uh, a lot of the data that we're collecting in the log program is contributing towards the, the management and stewardship of the resource in those provinces as well. One of the biggest things that uh, Muskies Canada does and how we separate ourselves from other log programs, some other Muskie programs that are happening is that uh, we track the unit effort. So we're looking at the hours per fish and using that uh, to help determine some of the, the trends over time. Uh, as a general rule, this information becomes more valuable over time. And of course, the more information we have, the more valuable that information becomes. So I'm going to go back to 1991. And the reason I'm choosing this is because that's the year we have digital log records back in our database at this time. And I'm going to focus in the numbers in red on the, the total numbers, but also the the row above that, pay attention to the 2020 numbers, just gives you an idea of what a, I'd say a fairly average year in recent years as to what the numbers we are seeing. But total logs now, we're approaching 45,000 logs submitted. Uh, we've had contribution from 3,400 anglers with nearly 400,000 rod hours. So there's the effort side of it. And the total fish caught and released is 27,000. So to put that, kind of summarize that, We've got 27,000 fish that we have effort data on. And that's uh, that does make this uh, very unique. And of course, the, the data very strong. Water bodies reported on in Ontario, we have, uh, have 127. And that's of, there's actually over 400 bodies of water in the province that have muskies. Quebec, we've had log reports from 33 water bodies and two within the province of New Brunswick. So when we're filling out those logs as members, uh, we're doing so on the online version these days. It used to be paper logs, but we want to make sure that we have the essential data. And for the purposes of Muskies Canada and the MNRF, um, some of this essential data varies, but uh, what we do want to see in there is your name, your date, the chapter, and your membership number. The great thing about the log program now is that, that as soon as you log in online, it automatically populates the name, the, your name, you can select the date, your chapter's there, and your membership number's there. So you want to submit data on the body of water, the total rod hours, number of fish caught, the length of those fish caught, and whether they were released or not. And, and, and by far, nearly 100% uh, of the fish caught and registered in the log program have been released. And another thing too that's newer is, um, this is more for tracking individual stats, is identifying fish that are caught by your partner. They may not be members of Muskies Canada, but at least you can use that information or we can use that information from their catch. 
And there's an option there to uh, no conditions of the fish, whether it's got lamprey on it, lamprey scars, lymphosarcoma. Uh, also, if, it, if it's a hybrid, for lots of talk this morning about hybrids, but that information is great to have on there as well. Then there's the personal side of the logs. So personally, I, I use this information and I'll enter this information such as my specific location, the lures that I'm using, trolling speed, weather, water visibility, water temperatures, so the water level, flows, moon phase, anything like that, that's personal. And, and really it's keeping personal logs, but more importantly, using them as a resource as well will make you a better angler. Some of the challenges with the log program is uh, number one is, is skunk reporting. Because the log program really focuses on the effort, if, if we're not reporting our skunks, we're actually skewing the data. And that's why it's important to have those skunk data. It's not can be nice or convenient to, to fill out those, those donuts, but it's extremely important uh, when you look at the overall effort it takes to catch a muskie. Participation, and I'll address each one of these individually, but um, we, we've heard this numerous times, there's a fear of exposing fisheries or hot fisheries or maybe small fisheries. And, and what I'll say to that is that as of 2014, when the MNRF reports on the water bodies from the log program, anything that's under 300 hours does not get reported on as named. Okay, so it's the bigger water bodies that have more angling pressure that are, are being named. If, if it's a smaller body of water, it will still be useful information for the ministry, but it'll just be reported as under the fisheries management zone. And there's privacy of information. And the big thing I'll note here is that the data that goes from Muskies Canada to the Ministry of Natural Resources, your personal information is pulled out of that. So they're not getting that. And that being your, your membership number and, and your name and any personal notes that you have uh, for your own personal logs, that does not get passed on. Then there's recording behaviors. Um, could be as simple as, not submitting logs or, or filling out your logs regularly. Or um, if you leave it too long, you may not get around to putting some logs in. So uh, trying to, if you're participating, try to participate to the fullest extent. And then guides, guides, this one's come up a lot. And I'll say this, guide data is extremely valuable. And you know, one of the things I like to refer to as the canary in the coal mine, guides are so intimate and on those bodies of water that they're the first ones to know the changes. Them being active participants in the log program helps that. and it's a lot of data that we're able to get because guys are on the water nearly every day. Reporting bias, uh, just the selective recording. One of the things I see a lot as the national research director is logs coming in maybe one per person per year because they've caught a really big fish and they want their certificate or their pin. And that's fine. I, I get, I get that. I think it's just important to bring this information back and that the effort is extremely important. That's why those skunks are so valuable. And then there's varying skill sets. Uh, so those that a guide might be on the water every day. And then there's those that may just do a weekend or a week long trip to a certain body of water. And uh, generally they're not going to be as in tune with what's happening. So the idea there is that the more data we have over time, the more that that smooths out and uh, there's less skewing of that data. And then recording errors, seeing less and less of this now that we've gone to an online log program submission form. Uh, there still are some issues, but for the most part, it's, uh, it's a lot better than the old paper logs that we used to use. For participating members, uh, there are incentives to Muskies Canada members. Uh, one is the release pins and certificates. Uh, so for every 36 inch plus muskie that's caught, uh, the log program tracks that and you'll get pins for your first, your 10th, your 25th, 50th, 100th, 200th, uh, any 50 inch fish or, or one per year and a 54 inch fish. And the certificates are for the 50 inch club and the 54 inch club. So if you get a 50 inch fish in that year, uh, you'll get a pin and a certificate for the 50 inch. Uh, release awards, uh, national or, or by chapter, there's a number of awards that are out there. There's also the annual rod and reel incentive draw that's, that's done nationally. And there's also chapter incentive draws. And those can sometimes occur monthly or at the end of the season. So some of the big enhancements that the program's undergone in the last five or so years, uh, the first one being the fact that it's gone online. 
Uh, it's extremely handy and, and much easier to uh, report, uh, put your logs in. But also from a personal perspective, when I'm trying to manage the data in the log program and the awards and stats and all that stuff is that I now have the ability to do exports and, and get reports that way. And uh, that's been a huge relief uh, for me. Um, it's very time consuming and this has helped out a lot from the, the back end. Historical logs, they're available to members dating back to 1991. So they're all there. Um, you can see that through the members area. And uh, it's, it's some nice graphical interfaces now where you can actually go on yours and see the a graph of your outings, your skunks, your catches, the hours per catch. It's there. Even the monthly distribution of your catches. There's a nice pie chart there that shows that. And then as you achieve certain milestones as far as release of fish, um, those pins at the bottom will go from gray and they'll actually light up and shows that you've you've got that pin. And I'll mention too, and I should have hit it on it before, if you do get a fish under 36 inches, uh, while it does not count towards your, your lifetime release awards, the, the data is still extremely valuable uh, in the log program for use by the ministry. So uh, keep that in mind. Nice fancy little dial here, this um, for your current season. Uh, so 2021 on the left here, you can see I haven't personally been fishing, obviously seasons are closed. So there's, there's nothing happening there, but on the right side, you can actually see your, your releases that are 36 inch and above, your hours per catch, your total skunks from all your logs, and your skunk percentage. Just a, just a nice quick view of uh, your results. And fourth, and probably the, the biggest enhancement uh, for use by the members is the, the analytics portion of the website. So as a, as a member, you can, you can go into the analytics area and actually run a whole suite of different uh, queries. And uh, we'll get into that. It's been a lot of work. And I guess Peja and Pierre have been integral to the development of this. It's available to any members who've submitted 10 logs or more. But one of the caveats is that you do have to have included skunks somewhere in those logs. And so if you've done all this, here's how you get it. You go to the members only portion of the website. Uh, you click on fishing logs in the members area. And you hit the drop down menu for fishing logs. And at the bottom, you'll see the last pick is analytics. And what you can do from there, I say you can run a whole suite of queries. You can select by year, month, body of water, chapter, moon phase. And there's a, there's a good number of parameters here. And this, I expect to see this grow as, as requests are made. But uh, this time you can do log count, hours per fish, average fish size, largest fish. And then you can look at fish size percentage stacked. But you can also look at hours per certain size of fish. And uh, there's a couple other ones in there too. And then you can select all water bodies or you can select the an individual water body. And one of the neat features on this too is the top right there, if you click that little box, it says show my stats. And when, what that does is you can compare your numbers against those uh, from Muskies Canada. So a simple output here is just hours per fish by year. And at the bottom, there, there would be all the years there and then shows the hours per fish um, in each one of the bars. Hours per fish by body of water. And I'm not gonna go into detail, I'm just showing you some of the features or, or the capability of the analytics program. Hours per 50 inch fish by body of water. You can see some, some, some are zero, that's because there hasn't been a 50 inch fish reported from that body of water yet. Uh, but you can see the numbers vary significantly uh, from dozens to uh, thousands of hours per 50 inch fish. And this is a really neat uh, graph here is the uh, fish size stacked by body, body of water. So body of water is across the bottom. So each column represents a different body of water. But what you can pull out of that is if you look at the, the colors on there, your fish that are in the range of less than 35 inches so less than three feet are, are going to be your in the orange and your 36 to 43 are going to be in the green and the percent of fish that are 44 to 49 are in the dark blue or purple and in the light blue you have your fish that are over 50 inches so it's a nice way to look at um different population or, or size structure within the populations of those bodies of water based on the results of the, the log program and the last couple of other, because I think these are fun anyways, uh, it keeps it light, but uh, we all talk about moon phases and there's a lot of 
controversy or opinions on this one. I will say from almost 45,000 logs, it's really interesting to look at this uh, new moon, full moon, or, you know, I've always been proposed as the best times to fish. Well, this is your full moon here at, at 10, a little over 10 hours per fish, your new moon at 10.5. It's not just by looking at this not statistically significant. And then the next question I would have is, well, how about size of fish? So we look at size by moon phase. Again, um, full moon, 37.6, 37.4 the new moon, not, not statistically significant in my opinion. So it's, it's interesting to see this because you don't often get to see the effort uh, broken down by, by moon phase. So you can play with this, the analytics, a ton of great features on there if you're a participating member and it's, I uh, encourage participation in the log program and having access to this because it's a wonderful tool. So before I pass this off to Dan here, uh, what do we do with the data? Well, Muskies Canada collects the log data. It's checked over and edited, and we submit that to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. The Ministry of Natural Resources Forestry summarizes and analyzes the data. And that data can be used to describe status and trends in the fisheries and inform management decisions. And with that, I thank everyone. Uh, right now we're taking questions at the end. I'm going to pass this over to Dan. And now that I'm muted, everybody can see my slides. I'm getting a little bit of echo. Is that your mute mic, Uh Could be. I'm going I'm to mute. Okay. So thanks, Davin. Thanks for uh, that introduction and that run through of how Muskies Canada collects and uses that information. Uh, I'm going to walk through how the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, uses some of the information coming in from the log program. Uh, but before I get into that, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the overall framework for managing muskies in Ontario. Um, if I can get my slides to advance, there we go. Uh, so, you know, as has been mentioned, as Davin mentioned, there's about 400 lakes and rivers in Ontario uh, that have uh, muskies in them. Um, doesn't sound like a lot when you compare it to the tens of thousands of lakes and rivers we have, but uh, all of our, our systems are naturally producing with the exception of, of Lake Simcoe where the restoration project is currently uh, underway and the stocking efforts have happened and now we're hoping that those fish will uh, begin to naturally reproduce. Uh, when you think about it from a, a, a North American and global scale for muskies, we have about one quarter of all muskie populations uh, in the world. And when you think about in, uh, native and naturally producing populations, we're higher than that. We're up to about 30, 33% of, of populations exist in Ontario. Uh, and that's more than any other jurisdiction. And when you think about the size of the water bodies that muskies inhabit in, in Ontario. There's some really big water bodies there. The Lake of the Woods is the Laxools, the Lake Nipissings, um, probably the, you know, the overall hectares that, and acres that, that muskies inhabit in Ontario is even a greater proportion. And, and what the way we think about that is, is we have a global responsibility for managing muskies and muskie populations. And it's something that uh, we really need to get right if we want this species to continue. And unfortunately, uh, we do have a, a little bit of a legacy where we weren't getting things right at times. And if up to the 1970s, uh, commercial harvest of muskies was occurring uh, at different time periods. It was fairly intensive. There was excessive harvest in some water bodies and there was a lot of habitat loss. Muskies rely on uh, spawning areas that are wetlands and a lot of those have been infilled through development projects and, and the like of that. Um, so it was a species that was, was really hard hit uh, by not just harvest, but by habitat loss. And I think it was mentioned earlier, they were pressured from at both ends of their life cycle. Uh, beginning in the late 1970s when Muskies Canada was formed or, or continuing with the, the formation of Muskies Canada was a greater advocacy uh, for the fish, for the species, uh, recognizing this was a, a valuable sport fish species and when we needed to put some efforts into protecting, uh, not just as a fishery, but as a, as a valuable uh, part of our healthy ecosystems. So through the 1980s, Muskies Canada was really active in, in, in encouraging uh, increased awareness and conservation for muskies and muskie fisheries. And that led to um, uh, the, the more investigation of, of muskies from a scientific perspective to gain better understanding of, of how they behave, how they grow, and, and how um, we can manage them. And, and through that, that work, a lot of it was led by uh, Dr. Castleman um, and, and, and other colleagues of his. Uh, and we actually took that science and we began to implement uh, the muskie management program that started in 2001 and that was the establishment of standard size limits, uh, standard catch and, catch and possession limits, and standard seasons for muskies across Ontario. So since we implemented that framework in 2001, um, and, and, and you know, through the, not just the implementation of that framework, but through the science and through the advocacy and, and catch and release angling, 
we're now to the point where we have world-class musky fisheries and the effort now is to try to maintain those fisheries uh, moving forward so we can continue to, to reap those benefits. Um, and talking a little bit about the science and, and how that went into um, our management, it really is the backbone of the program and, 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 and pun intended, I guess the, the bone of the program that we use is the clythra. It's a bone in the lower jaw of, musky, of a muskie. And when you, when you pull that out of the fish, you can actually get a whole bunch of information on from that fish. You can understand how old that fish is and you can estimate um, how big it was at various points in its lifetime. So you, uh, you get the growth rate of each fish from that bone. And then when you combine um, the clythra from, from many fish within that same population, you can actually get to understand how the overall population is growing. And that's what this figure shows that the two axes on the, the going up the graph are, are just the length, uh, either in, in the metric or imperial measurements and uh, the fish over time. And this is, is a theoretical growth curve, but um, some of our, our growth um, does mimic this. And we use this to set our minimum size limits. And what we're trying to do is understand uh, the characteristics of that growth. So the line in the middle uh, of these bands is the, the mean growth rate. So that's the average rate that, that a fish from this population grows. And then these two bars, the higher and the lower one, uh, represent the range that 99% of the fish would fit into. Um, so, you know, you have your fast growers uh, up here, the larger fish, and then you have your slow growers, the smaller fish down here. But overall, we have an understanding of the overall growth rate of the population. And a key variable is this lower 99% confidence interval. And that's the size that 99 out of 100 fish would reach um, if, if left to live as long as they possibly could. And, and we've used that, that value to help set our minimum size limits. And depending on, on what the population growth rate is, it, would, it aligns with one of our four minimum uh, size limits. And that's either, you know, if this growth curve came out around 40 inches, we would assign the 40 inch minimum size limit. This one happens to come out close to that 44 inch size limit. So for this population, that would be the appropriate size limit. And then we have other populations in the province that have higher growth rates than this and come out closer to the either the 122 centimeter or the 137 uh, centimeter size limit. So um, the work that was done through the 1990s was able to characterize that there were differences in growth populations in Ontario and, and start to establish and bin those populations into one of these size limits. Now we didn't have data for every single musky population. Uh, so we knew we needed to have a, another size limit set aside for uh, just standard protection of musky populations where either there wasn't data or perhaps maybe the, the growth rates were, were extremely low. And what we looked at there was a concept that we wanted to allow fish to spawn at least twice. Um, so we knew that females were maturing around age five. And we said, if we protect them until age seven, they've had two spawning opportunities. And uh, hopefully that will give the level of protection required to sustain populations uh, moving forward. So that's where the uh, 36 inch minimum size limit comes from is this, is this uh, reproductive size plus two. So the average uh, size of about age seven for female muskies. So, that's how we set those five different minimum size limits. And depending on where you fish, you, you fish under uh, different size limits at different times. Um, but it is really rooted into the growth potential of the populations. And uh, as I mentioned, the key thing there is that we have these different growth rates uh, in the province. And when we implemented this in 2001, uh, we, we established uh, some really coarse and high, uh, objectives for the fisheries. We said those fish populations that we're managing with the lower size limits, those are populations that don't grow uh, as quickly and as large as, or not even as quickly, it's about how large they grow ultimately. Um, and those are the populations we're gonna manage for high numbers of muskies and high catch rate fisheries. And then we had the ones in between the, the 112 and the 122 centimeter, uh, 44 or 48 inch minimum size limits. And that's where we're hoping to see uh, bigger fish showing up in the populations and more of them. And then we had the, the record class size fisheries, those 137 centimeter, the 54 inch minimums, uh, where we really want to produce the absolute biggest fish we possibly can. And so, as I mentioned, this, this framework was implemented at first in 2001, and it has been the foundation for um, changes to, to minimum size limits since that time. So now that we understand what the framework is, now we can get to looking at whether or not the framework is working. Uh, we are 20 years later uh, since we implemented it, and uh, it, it's a, a good time to, to have a look at some of the data and see if we can uh, understand um, understand that how these fisheries have responded to, to our management approach and, and, and the other things that are going on as well. Um, when we look at angler diary data, it's we call it fisheries dependent data. So it's data that's derived from the people who are fishing. And often that data uh, can be really challenging in managing fisheries. And one of the big reasons is, especially for a muskie population, 
is the data can be highly variable. So you have a lot of people who go out and don't catch a lot. And then you have uh, some anglers that are, are quite successful or days that are particularly successful. So there can be a lot of noise in that catch data that makes detecting trends uh, uh, a little difficult. And the other thing that's really problematic with fisheries dependent data, and it just applies to recreational fishing and commercial fishing, is the fishers themselves can be very good at finding fish, even when they're not particularly abundant. Uh, so catch rates may not respond to changes in, in, in uh, fish populations. We may see actually high catch rates, even though the fish population is, is in decline. So we're generally reluctant to use uh, fisheries dependent data in, in assessing fisheries, but for muskies, um, the programs like index netting programs that we can run for lake trout and walleye and other fish species, um, just given the low abundance of muskies, given their size and the type of gear you need to catch them, uh, we don't have those index netting programs uh, in place. And if we if we wanted to establish an index netting program for muskies, it would be extremely labor intensive. So uh, we don't have a lot of fishery independent data. So let's look at this angler, angler diary data and see if there's potential there um, to tell us about musky fisheries, musky populations. And the key questions are, uh, from my perspective, are can we observe trends in the response in the fishery uh, when, when we see changes in abundance? And uh, I guess, I don't wanna say fortunately, but, but um, you know, we have seen some populations go through dramatic changes in, their, in the abundance of adult fish. And if you think about the VHS die-offs from 2005, 2006 on the St. Clair River, or sorry, on Lake St. Clair or the St. Lawrence River, uh, we saw big changes in adult musky populations. And the, the good news from a data perspective is we do see responses or, or, or that sort of a change show up in the angler guy data. I'm not going to present that here just because I don't have a lot of time to, to go through all of the, the as Dave mentioned, it's 27,000 fish or so. Um, but, you know, the good news is we do see that, that um, low catch rates during the period of time immediately following the die-offs on both of those water bodies. And that gives us some um confidence that that with the, some of the trends we'll see when we have good participation in the diary program uh will will track musky abundance and the things i want to talk about today are how uh the characteristics of Ontario's musky fisheries uh, is there information in the diary data that can describe those characteristics and how they responded under the framework um so getting into that and when we talk about the characteristics of fisheries it's really about two things uh, it's about how many fish are, we, are anglers catching, and we can, Davin talked about that in terms of fish per hour. I'm, or sorry, he talked about it in terms of hours per fish. I'm going to talk about it in, in fish per hour as much as anything, uh, just a, a little different uh, way of explaining the same thing. And then we'll talk about the size of fish, and we can talk about the size of the fish and the fishery using a number of different things. We can talk about average size. Uh, Davin presented or showed some of the stuff on size distribution, so how many fish or what proportion of fish fit in the different size categories. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we can even dive deeper into the data and talk about catch rates by size or maximum size or even characteristics of, of how um, you know the top uh, five or ten percent of fish and how that changes and, and there's a lot of interesting things in this data i won't get into all of it but i um, always happy to chat more about it uh, but we should see differences in the data um, among water bodies given that we um, given that we know there are differences in how those fish grow those, those differences should be apparent in the fisheries characteristics I'm going to build on this slide or this graph in the next few slides, but I want to take a chance, uh, take a second, just to explain uh, some of the, the elements of it. Um, up the y-axis here, up the, the 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 side, is the proportion of fish greater than than 45 inches, and we picked 45 inches because for a lot of people, that's a big fish. It's not a huge fish, and it's not those those 50-inch absolute trophies that we all are after, but it is a big fish, and it can be a, a personal trophy, and it's a big fish. Um, you know, it's a size that, that most fisheries in Ontario can attain. So as you go up this axis, a greater percent of the fish in that, in the, in that, um, in that fishery are achieving that size. So if, if the value was 0.3, it means that 30% of the fish reported uh, in the program are greater than 144 inches. And then across the bottom axis here is just the catch rate in terms of number of fish per hour. So the higher the catch rate, uh, the more quickly you're catching fish. And just to give a point of reference, um, you know, a catch rate of, of 0.10 means a fish every 10 hours. The a catch rate of 0.05 means a catch rate of, of about 20 fish to 20 hours to catch a fish. And um, if we get it to the right here, it's, it's uh, less time, five hours for 0.20. So when we think about musky fisheries, and we think about anything that falls out on this, this right side of the axis, the right side of the graph, 
uh, are those really high catch rate fisheries where you're going to see lots of fish. And, and for, for a lot of us, that's a really good thing. If we see fisheries that are in the top half of the, of the, the graph, those are the, the, the populations where we're seeing more bigger fish. Um, and if it's to the left here, it, there may not be as many of them. So um, we, do, we do think that our fisheries are, 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 um, are showing some trade-offs like that, but let's actually look at some of the data from the Angler Diary program. This is the, the values for the last 10 years, and I've color-coded them based on the size limit that's in place. Um, you can see the blue triangles are zones where we have a 36 inch minimum in place and we've taken the water bodies and, and combined those. And it's a 10 year average from 2009 to 2019. And then the orange dots on this graph are the, the we don't have water bodies uh, with the 40 inch minimum that are fished intensively enough to allow us to, to calculate these metrics. So we've had to jump it up to the, to the 44. Uh, but you see, this is where you see Balsam Lake uh, Pigeon Lake, the Rideau River, Lake Scugog, and Lake St. Clair are, are the ones that, that are uh, enough involvement in the program that we can, we can plot these information, uh, this information. And what you see here is, is generally a uh, fairly low percent of the fish are, are really big or over that 45 minimum, minimum size limit threshold, uh, but fairly high catch rates. And, and a high catch rate over, on average over 10 years, uh, to see it above 0 0.10 uh, means it's a, it's a, a, a decent fishery. There will be years for, for an individual lake where this is higher or lower. Again, this is an average. Um, so there is some, some variations. In some years, the, the water bodies do seem to produce them. But what we see is, is a grouping of these fish, um, high, relatively high catch rates and relatively low average size. When we add on uh, the higher size limit fisheries, uh, so the green here are the 48 inch minimum, um, Lake Nipissing and the French River. And then the, the purple tri uh, diamonds are St. Lawrence River, Georgian Bay and um, the, the Ottawa River, you see that these water bodies tend to group uh, lower catch rates and uh, higher average size of, of the fish. And again, as a 10 year average, it's really amazing that um, the St. Lawrence River is producing, you know, half of the fish caught in, on the St. Lawrence River in the last 10 years have been, been 45 inches or larger. So this is good news in terms of, of seeing, when you think about this, again, from the perspective of the data and is the data reflecting uh, what we think we know about the fisheries, uh, we are seeing uh, groupings, these, the, the, we expected to see these water bodies grouping like this based on the minimum size limits uh, and the growth potential, and we are seeing that in the data. So it's, a, it's, it's good, the data is telling us uh, what we want. And we are seeing uh, that trade-off. So when we go fishing in Ontario for muskies, um, depending on where you live, you have the opportunity to go somewhere and, and have an expectation that you're going to catch uh, a good number of fish. Um, but when you go to those high density water bodies, you know, on average, your fish are going to be smaller. And then if, if a trophy, a uh, really big fish is, the, is what you really want, you have those opportunities to go to some of those, those higher minimum size limit fisheries. And um, you may have to put in a little bit more time, but uh, you'll be rewarded by a, a bigger fish. Um, and another thing like I, as I kind of alluded to is that um, we get more confidence in this data and, and, and see uh, less variation in the data, the more and more participation we get in the program. So the more Muskies Canada members participate, uh, the more you submit logs for, for data uh, with data, the, the more uh, confidence we gain in, in what it's telling us. So now moving on to, to the trends in the muskie fishery uh, themselves and, and looking at what's happened since, uh, as David mentioned, we have the data digitized from 1991 to 2019. Uh, but I'm going to focus in on the period of 2001 to 2019, since that's the period since the framework was, was implemented. And the key questions are, have we seen an increase in the number of muskies caught? And we can measure that through the catch breeding effort reported by the anglers. And then we can ask, are there more big fish in the population? So that was an objective of the program, uh, particularly for those enhanced size uh, fisheries, uh, was to, to produce uh, more of those bigger fish. And we can look at catch rates by size, proportion of fish by size. I'd love to have had time to go through um, all of the analysis we've done and, and show you some of the graphs. Um, but given the, the time we're allowed, I, I, I'm instead gonna present a summary table. And as a reminder, the blue uh, color is, is ind indicative of the 36 inch minimums. Uh, the, the, I don't know if that's an orangey pink color, uh, depending on your screen. Uh, those are the 44 inch uh, minimums. Then you get into the 48s in green and in purple again, the, the 54 inch minimum size limits. So overall, we see in most cases an increasing trend in both the catch rate and the catch rate uh, for, for fish greater than 45 inches. And in some of those other factors I, look, I talked about in terms of average size of fish um, and some of the, the distributions, uh, we, we see these same consistent positive trends. Um, in most cases, they may not be statistically significant, 
Um, but um, I'll talk about this in a minute, but what, how, how we can maybe interpret that information and, and the things we need to consider. So overall, seeing some good things. And if I was able to walk through, um, uh, and, I, and Ottawa River one was one that was flagged there as a decreasing trend since 2001 and a statistically significant decreasing trend. Uh, so this is the data from the Ottawa River going back to 1991 for catch rate in terms of fish per hour um, over, over the time period. Uh, and you can see that, yes, uh, we have seen a decline since 2001. Um, but when we put this in the context of, and that's why it's really important to, to not just think about the, the, the individual water body, but to also think about the water bodies that are being managed um, you know, based on the same growth potential. And when you compare the Ottawa River now uh, in the more you know, 2010 to present, it's at or above uh, the catch rates reported for the St. Lawrence River or for Georgian Bay, those other 54 inch minimums. So, um, you know, there may have been just something going on in that early 2000 period, whether, it's, uh, you know, the particular anglers who, anglers who were contributing to the program are really, really good. Maybe, uh, maybe the, the fish were a little less naive then and more eager to bite. Uh, maybe we just had some really strong year classes uh, um, in place at that time. Um, it, and for, unfortunately, it's hard to dissect the exact reasons, but I guess, it's important to look at some of those relationships and maybe some uh, some uh, maybe just it probably wasn't reasonable to think that the Ottawa River would maintain a catch rate of of zero point one two or higher uh, indefinitely, and because that is higher than what we see in the Kawarthas and a lot of other places. So, um, just important to put some context in some of those 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 that information. Um, so I, as I mentioned, there's some things we have to consider when we're interpreting trends in the fishery. Um, we do expect muskie populations in particular to be slow to respond. Um, they are a fairly long-lived species. You know, we, uh, Dr. Kassman's work showed fish up to 30 years of, of age um, uh, from Georgian Bay and, and, and 25, 20 years old in some of the other systems. Um, so it, it takes a while, especially when your program is, is trying to to build up the adult stock that then produces consistent or is consistent of possible year classes. Uh, those things will take time, so so I wouldn't have it wouldn't have been valuable to look at uh, these trends in 2010 um, when we implemented the program in 2001. It does take time to let those things happen, and generally we see that 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 those recoveries in in, in populations can or changes uh, um, in positive trends generally happen slower than than declines. If if you you over harvest a fish species or you you eliminate spawning habitat or something, you can see those declines uh, fairly rapidly. Um, we also know that natural systems are highly variable. Um, we have changed size limits and we've, we've built on the catch and release program, uh, but there's still a lot of, of other things going on in the background, interactions with other fish, climate, um, all those sorts of things that cause noise and it, it really makes it difficult to, to detect any trends in fish populations uh, with, with, you know, absolute certainty. And I think it's also important to point out that, you know, yes, we, we implemented the program in 2001, the, the management framework, uh, but before that time, we were managing with minimum size limits, uh, a little less consistency in those minimum size limits. We we're also seeing over that, you know, prior to that time through the, the late 90s or through the 90s and into the 2000s, more and more catch and release. Those things were iterative. They didn't all just happen at once. It wasn't like we flipped a switch um, in 2001. And, and so you didn't necessarily expect to see um, a, uh, an immediate response in the fisheries. Uh, and, and I think it's really important to think about, even though you know, it'd be nice if all these trends were, statist were statistically significant and we could say this program was working amazingly and we had all the, the, the statistical proof to, to, to go with that. But um, given the overall increasing, you know, the prevalence of increasing trends, that's a really good thing for muskie fisheries and muskie populations, uh, especially when you think about if we were to look at other fish species, uh, we may not see those trends across as, as big as an area as we do. And even more importantly, from an angler's perspective, um, things don't have to be st statistically significant to be significant to you. So even just a slight increase in catch rate going from 0 0.08 fish per hour to, to 0 0.1 uh, probably isn't statistically significant, but it means, you know, instead of taking a 10 hour day to catch a fish, it's a seven and a half hour day to catch a fish on average. And if you're putting in a hundred hours, it's an extra two fish. And, and given how rare it can be to catch a muskie, I don't know anybody's going to turn down an extra two fish uh, over that time period. And, and we all know that that, that extra half an inch um, can really make the difference and can be the difference between you know, a, a quality fish and your personal best. And, and that's what we're all out there trying to do when we're musky fishing. And the other thing to keep in mind is and it's the point I kind of was alluding to with, with the Ottawa River is there are some natural limitations in the fishery. Muskies are top predators. There's, there's uh, 
the ceiling for their abundance um, is different than, than when we think about sunfish or we think about walleye or, or some of those other populations. There's just not going to be as many of them um, as there are other species. And just the last kind of, to, to, to emphasize this point, um, the more and more information we get from anglers in this program, uh, the more participation we get, the more lakes you're, you're reporting on more often, uh, the more lakes we can and water bodies we can add to these data sets and uh, with each passing year, you know, you start to get more and more confidence in the trends you're seeing. Um, it, it's it, the more we the more we can get people involved, the better. And, and I really hope we can uh, keep folks involved. So uh, talk a little bit about how we've been using the data. Um, I want to talk just very briefly about um, how we might use the data moving forward. We might be able to use some metrics from the angler log program uh, to build our objective now when we're doing zone planning or when we're developing uh, specific objectives for uh, for water bodies we're managing. Uh, we, we do use the data to help verify the growth potential. So when we've had uh, opportunities to look at minimum size limits, um, we not, don't just look at the growth potential, we'll, we'll kind of verify and say, well, is the fishery producing uh, some of these big fish that the growth potential um, suggests it should? And, and it's been a good tool to help verify for the St. Lawrence River and, and for a couple other places uh, that that's, um, those fish are in the, in the fishery. Um, there may be some opportunities to, rather than having to, to when you take the clythera from a fish, you, you obviously, um, that's lethal sampling. And a lot of the fish in the early stages of the program are from taxidermy and, and those things are less and less common now. So we maybe need to start thinking about alternatives uh, to growth potential, or sorry, alternatives to, to using the clythera to determine growth potential. And I, I think there's probably some potential in the data that just requires a bit of a, a statistical analysis. And the other, the one challenge we have, or one of the challenges we have with, with the data and diary program is, is Muskies Canada members are, are largely fishing in the lakes in Southern Ontario, um, you know, including everything from Lake Nipissing South. Uh, but we aren't getting a lot of information from that stronghold of muskie up in Northwest Ontario. Uh, just not enough uh, representation. There's so anything we could do to um, get some of that effort data and uh, get some of the, these analysis calculated for those water bodies. It's, it'd be, be a really good addition to the program. So the last thing I want to do on behalf of Davin and myself is, is acknowledge the contributions of, of the folks in Muskies Canada and, and to, uh, the MNRF who, who had the foresight to establish this program. Um, it's it's uh, I, one of the highlights of, of my job is getting to look at this information and and uh, and and see what, what's in, going on in the Muskie data. So uh, I quite enjoy it. And I'm glad that uh, there's an opportunity to do that. And I think that it's, it's really good information and a really good partnership uh, for the program. So with that, um, I think we have a little time for questions. Um, but if you, you feel more comfortable sending myself or Davin an email, our contact information um, is there. And we're happy to, to, to chat with you um, over email. Thank you. Okay, Dan, you want me to take that one from Jeff? I don't see a question. So. Oh, right there. Yes, just just popped up from Jeff Fry. So I, I don't I don't know the 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 exact proportion, but I guess uh, what what I will say is this: uh, when you submit your log to Muskies Canada through the online log submission, the data about the fish, that being the size, the um, the hours, the effort put in the water body, that information will get shared with the Ministry of Natural Resources. The personal data, uh, that being your name, your even your membership number for that matter, and any details you put in about the catch or, or your personal your personal log information, that, uh, that remains private. That doesn't get passed on or shared. And from the Muskies Canada analytics perspective, um, just the data, from water body and effort is used so it's it's not looking at your actual your name won't be shared on there your, your data will but not your name okay so um I see this, this question is about applying size limits across the zone and, and you're you're right that um and, and we have tried to take a more a, a zone-wide approach for um, a lot of other species. Muskies are kind of one of the last ones where we're managing them lake by lake. Um, it is something we're we're considering is is looking at what the dominant size limit is, and it is something we've done in places like Zone 17, 
um, and zone 10 more recently, I think applying the a little less complex and trying to simplify that, but it's something that's coming up through zone planning exercises in Ontario and, and something we'll look to, to move forward with uh, through that process. So you're right, it is uh, trying to find the right balance between uh, the appropriate size limit that's based on science and uh, minimizing or, or reducing the complexity where we can. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How has it been going over here in Muskie's Canada official? G'day, Ryan. <laughs> Great. So, so I missed most of what you guys talked about. The good news is I I could listen to Davin all day long. Um, I, uh, I cannot stop singing his praises. But what's been happening over on the auction side has been crazy. I'm going to say thank you and uh, tell my producers to kick you on out of here. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Good work. And we'll talk soon. All right. Muskie's Canada official. The auction page is out of control. Um, we are we are getting donations on the fly. We are seeing some incredible support.